This video is not to say that rape is not wrong or that it should not be illegal. This is merely a set of observations on the meaning of society's perception of and response to the crime and how feminist lobbying fits in. I'm going to discuss the term as a social construct along with feminist rape culture theory and what that does or does not mean about the two ideas. First, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and state a uh, definition of a social construct and I'm going to put that up on the screen. This comes from encyclopedia.com and it's from the definition of social constructionism. In the domain of social constructionist thought, a social construct is an idea or notion that appears to be natural and obvious to people who accept it but may or may not represent reality. So it remains largely an invention or artifice of a given society. And I want to remind everybody that feminists use the term social construct to delegitimize everything about traditional or existing gender roles in society that they don't like. Now the next thing I'm going to do is go a little bit over the etymology of rape because it's kind of interesting. Uh, I am using the online etymology dictionary for that and I'm going to go ahead and put that up on the screen as well. Notice that the definitions don't necessarily all involve a sexual assault. Here you have to seize prey, to abduct, to take by force, which doesn't necessarily mean anything more than to kidnap. Not only was the term not frequently used, there was actually another word that was used to describe the behavior. And then of course there's the uh, definition of a uh, cruciferous plant. It was quite interesting tracing the word rape back through the centuries to find that at one point the much more common usage for it was in recipe books such as this recipe for rape, a dish without turnips. So the question I have regarding the term rape is as it is treated by society today, is it a social construct? And of course the secondary question is, does that invalidate it? Well, to decide that, you have to look at the way it's been treated throughout history once it was finally used to uh, describe the act of forcing sex on another person. In uh, different societies, historical response to rape was dictated by factors based in the way sex was controlled and governed within society. The gender roles of the time and the way those gender roles affected the social impact rape had on a woman. Social taboos against promiscuity were about keeping bloodlines traceable. This affected premarital as well as extramarital sex and was partly a function of the way marriage worked in middle and upper class society. Marriage was contractual, not romantic. Intimacy was not something you just did because you were in love. It was part of a contract. Fidelity was part of that contract as an expression of family loyalty and a woman's honor was tied up in that. Forcing sex on her forced her to be dishonored by the rapist's attack on that loyalty, essentially breaking her perfect record, her virtue, against her will. Conversely, much of a man's honor was in his provision for his family and his protection of them, just as much as a woman's honor was tied up in her family loyalty. Because of that expectation of protection and support, raping a man's daughter or his wife was also considered a crime against him. Another factor was the use of intermarriage and childbearing to cement contracts and other agreements between families. Because of men's expectation of support and protection and because rape disrupted the way marriage was used in contracts, raping a man's daughter or his wife was also considered a crime against him. Because of the difference in the way intimacy was viewed and the way family loyalty was a part of a woman's honor, Old societies responded to rape as an act of deliberately contravening a woman's right or ability to refuse sex because consent wasn't in question. Within a marriage, reproductive sex was the duty of both spouses and outside of a marriage a woman was expected to refuse. In the context of that social environment, despite the reality that either sex can be violent, either sex can be averse to unwanted sexual contact, and either sex can blackmail the other into it. It seemed both natural and obvious to treat it as an only male perpetrated crime against only female victims. 
Despite the reality of the victim being directly affected and most harmed by the crime, it seemed natural and obvious to penalize it as a crime against her family, particularly the man responsible for her welfare and support. This is not to say that these attitudes are justified, but that society's past responses to rape show that the concepts of what it was and how society should respond to it were social constructs based on existing gender roles. So how has the dramatic evolution of women's roles in modern society changed that? Well, today, we're not limited in our prospects, depending on which man is willing or expected to be responsible for us, even though some women still act like we are. Our reputation as an honorable person is only as tied up in family loyalty as we allow it to be. We are completely free to make our own marital and career choices. Heterosexual marriage is not reserved as a way to formalize business deals. With women able to establish careers and support themselves, it's not even really a transfer of responsibility from fathers to husbands. The change to the modern view of rape as a crime against the individual's person, forced unwanted intimacy, violation of bodily autonomy that causes not only physical injury but also psychological damage is largely a result of these changes. It no longer seems natural and obvious to treat it as a crime against the family rather than strictly the victim. That did not, however, change society's tendency to treat it as a crime against only female victims perpetrated by only male assailants. It did not change the perception that the validity of an accusation depends on whether or not the accuser's right or ability to refuse had been contravened or ignored by the accused. This combination of factors in the public's perception of rape evolved from being based on family contract marriage to being based on gender roles associated with courtly love, though some aspects likely carried over from the former to the latter as male responsibility for women or the protector-provider role was still a constant even as women's role in society evolved. Courtship has always been treated as a man's responsibility involving initiation of contact, pursuit, and persuasion. The woman's role in that is simply to judge and make a choice to accept or reject her suitor's advances. Despite the reality that both men and women are sexual beings capable of initiating and pursuing a partner, in that social environment it seemed natural and obvious to view sexual contact as something men pursue and women gatekeep. It is that gender role dynamic which caused the perception of rape as an only male perpetrated, mostly female experienced crime to remain unchanged despite the reality of female capacity for sexual aggression. Now, uh, during the last several decades, feminists have fought to change one major factor in the public perception of rape. Rather than judging it by the intent of the accused, they want it judged by the perception of the accuser. Even if that perception changes between the time of the incident and the time of the accusation. Instead of defining the crime by a perpetrator's deliberate act of contravening the victim's refusal, They've defined it based on the accuser's experience of consent. Then they fought to treat female non-consent as a default assumption which must be disproved. This changed two very significant things. It effectively switched the burden of proof in rape cases so that rather than matching the legal standard of innocent until proven guilty, the accused is now responsible for proving his innocence. It also widened the scope of what could be treated as rape to include instances where the accuser had the capacity, opportunity, and power to refuse, or at least state a refusal, and for whatever reason did not. Among other things, it opened the door for feminists to start likening a sexual encounter to signing a contract where drunk sex is concerned, which treats actively participating in sex, a concrete thing, like a mere agreement, an abstract thing. That has led to feminists asserting that any man engaging in sex with any woman who has been drinking is raping her. They do not generally argue this both ways. If a woman has sex with a man who has been drinking, she is not to be considered a rapist by feminist terms. And also, if both people are drinking, they still consider the man and only the man guilty of rape. They also took extraordinary measures to avoid creating public perception of female perpetration against male victims. But I'll get into that more when I talk about feminist rape culture theory because it was directly involved in that.
But the gist of this is, the legal definition, including the various changes it has had throughout history, has always been based on what has been seen by the authorities of the time as the most natural and obvious definition. These definitions have throughout history been based on gender roles of the time. Our modern response to rape is still a social construct. It's still based on what authorities are persuaded by feminist academics and lobbyists to view as the most natural and obvious definition, still based on gender roles. Now, that does not invalidate treating rape as a crime. It doesn't even invalidate treating it as a crime that is separate and unique from other forms of assault, a violation of the victim's bodily autonomy and integrity. It does invalidate treating it as gender-specific, either in the act or the experience. And it calls into question the validity of feminist demands that it be judged by an accuser's experience of consent, rather than whether or not the accused deliberately contravened the accuser's refusal. And that brings us to feminist rape culture theory. Wikipedia, which has pretty much been taken over by feminists and is therefore assumed to be a representative reference material on feminist theory, describes feminist rape culture theory as follows. In feminist theory, rape culture is a setting in which rape is pervasive and normalized due to societal attitudes about gender and sexuality. The sociology of rape culture is studied academically by feminists. There is disagreement over what defines rape culture and as to whether any given societies meet the criteria to exhibit rape culture. While the Wikipedia article states that there is disagreement, feminists debating on social media discuss rape as if it is a confirmed environment all over the world. Support for the theory is prefaced on a few basic ideas. Factors offered as evidence for the claim that rape is normalized in society are mostly based on gender roles. Many involve complaints about responses to rape accusations which stem from viewing it as a crime in involving contravening a victim's refusal rather than defining it as feminists would by the accuser's hindsight observations regarding consent. As I showed earlier, that standard is based on gender roles, which include presuming men pursuers of sex and women automatically reticent to engage. It is a social construct, not a factual basis for argument. Another factor held up as evidence for rape culture is the denial that the crime is as widespread as feminists claim. In other words, denying rape culture is said to be proof of rape culture. That is circular reasoning and not a valid argument either. To create a valid argument based on it, feminists would have to prove that rape is, in fact, as pervasive and common as they claim. Support for that claim is based on a particular research method which has been extensively criticized for its inaccuracy and denial of women's agency to make their own choices. This method, created in 1987 by Professor Mary P. Koss of Kent State University, involves using ambiguously worded questions to allow researchers to label women's experiences for them rather than allowing women to label their experiences themselves. This was highly criticized by both Dr. Neil Gilbert, professor at Berkeley University, and author Christina Hoff Summers, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and former professor at Clark University. Both pointed out that a majority of respondents, in fact, three quarters of Koss's respondents, disagree with the researchers' evaluation of their experiences when that method is used. Another criticism involves the questions themselves, which are based, again, not on society's general perception of rape as a crime of contravening the victim's refusal, but on feminism's choice to define the crime by an accuser's hindsight observations regarding consent, which I've already shown is based on gender roles. By that definition, a woman can choose to have sex, actively participate in a sex act, and still afterward claim to be raped. That led to costs, including questions regarding experiences that did not legally constitute rape. And feminists have used the results of those surveys to argue for changes in rape laws. In other words, if we define this experience as rape, and then interpret a lot of women's answers to say that they have been raped 
based on it sounding like they had this experience the way we're picturing it, then we can argue for Congress to say, look, this experience is rape. Let's legislate it. Further, Cost used the ambiguous phrase, when you didn't want to, a concession to feminism's definition using consent, again, rather than something more explicit like against your will to describe the respondent's state of mind during the encounter. This increased the likelihood of yes answers from women who had willingly participated in sex acts because they'd been promised something or because they'd thrown caution to the wind when consuming alcohol, or despite not being in the mood, decided to have sex with a partner because he asked. So the claim that rape is pervasive relies on statistics garnered by ignoring women's assessment of their own experiences and based on rape definitions stemming from traditional gender roles. That choice severely undercuts that claim. There's another issue with the theory. Feminist writing about it, including the Wikipedia article, discusses the concept almost exclusively in terms of male perpetration. Mention of female perpetration is usually limited to instances where it can be associated with the feminist term toxic masculinity or the claim that little or no statistics exist on female perpetration. Those stats do exist, but they're not treated as stats on female perpetration of rape, and there's a really sneaky reason why. An historical push by feminists to avoid obtaining and publicizing them. This can also be traced back to Koss's research. In addition to uh, problems with her questions, she specifically worded her definition of rape to exclude the most likely way a female rapist would assault a male victim, forcing him to penetrate her. Koss avoided interviewing men, but knowing that others using her methodology might not, she designed a method to exclude them from rape statistics. The CDC used Koss's methodology for its National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. The results from that survey can be used to show that when both sexes' responses to Koss's style of questionnaire are evaluated honestly, the numbers show equal experience and near equal perpetration of rape between the sexes. All it takes is to include being made to penetrate in the definition of rape. Instead, when men surveyed using Casa style of questions say they were forced to penetrate their perpetrator, their answers are not defined as rape, but relegated to the lesser category, other sexual assault. Koss had no explanation for her choice to do that, but instead said, it is inappropriate to consider as a rape victim a man who engages in unwanted sexual intercourse with a woman. In other words, while feminist researchers bend over backward to avoid considering women as active participants in sexual encounters with men, they start from the assumption that even when forced, a man is an active participant in any sexual encounter with a woman. Researchers behind the CDC's NISVS survey were asked why they used that definition. Their answer indicated they had no idea. The uh, male respondents reporting being faced to, forced to penetrate, well, it didn't really give um, a very clear reason why that was treated differently than when a, a female is forcibly penetrated. Uh, do you have some explanation on that? Uh, I mean, the reports define the, the made to penetrate um, variable, like it's in the 2010 report as well. Um, there's a box that kind of describes how those variables were measured in this list. Well, it, what it does is it just basically says that that was excluded from the de definition of rape. Rape is, um, is there's a, there is a definition of rape, and it's a, a, a separate form of victimization than the made to penetrate. And it, if you look at the um, published reports, it defines, it shows how the rape was defined and how made to penetrate was defined. And these are also um, in line <clears throat> with the um, CDC uniform, um, you know, definitions for sexual violence. But what was uh, the criteria for deciding that being made to penetrate wasn't rape, whereas being forcibly penetrated was? As I said, they describe um, 
how they were measured. And for more, you know, sort of background information uh, in the field on how um, the different definitions of rape and, you know, uh, actually we're the first survey to actually include this um, made to penetrate. Um, but you can sort of, there's experts and processes from all over the country going back several years in terms of trying to get, um, you know, ideas of how to uh, measure these constructs and surveys. And that's why we do go with, uh, you know, all the behaviorally intended, uh, behaviorally specific victimization um, questions. And, uh, you know, the, we measured several types of sexual violence victimization um, in, the, in, the sur in the survey based on those victimization, those very specific, there's like 60 different victimization <laughs> questions we asked. Well, at one time, based on traditional gender roles and stereotypes, it seemed natural and obvious to view rape as a crime against only women. The reality is there's no rational cause for defining forced sex differently when it happens to men. And while at one time, based on those traditional gender roles and stereotypes, it seemed natural and obvious to assume that only men could commit rape, statistics show the reality that women are perpetrators too. As with male victims, there's no rational cause today to exclude their actions from the crime's definition. So, feminist rape culture theory appears to be entirely based on social constructs stemming from adherence to traditional gender roles and stereotypes. The belief that sexual encounters involve men pursuing a woman's acquiescence and never the other way around, and the perception of men as always active participants, but women as passive experiencers of an encounter. Unlike with the treatment of rape as a crime, which is valid, and unlike the separation of rape from other forms of assault, which is also valid, this does invalidate rape culture theory. Because when you take those factors out, those gender roles and the uh, resulting social constructs, every bit of evidence feminists present for that theory crumbles. It may not be a dish without turnips, but it is certainly a theory without merit. <laughs>